Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Shane. I can't think of a better way to get on an airplane tonight than leaving us with that. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to 1 John chapter 1. How many of you were here last week? Just raise your hand very quickly. How many of you remember taking a test last week from zero to 10? Anybody remember that? Now, you have to be honest. How many of you, when you took that initial test, graded yourself anywhere between one and nine? Raise your hand and raise it high. All right, how many of you knew that was unbiblical? It's either zero or 10, right? Either you're in the light or in the darkness. So as we go back to 1 John, I want you to remember the kind words of this 90-year-old apostle speaking to a group of what we would often call second and third generation believers. So when you're 90 years old and you say to a 70-year-old, my little children, do do not be offended by that. 90-year-olds can say anything they want to say. And so as they give that compassion, but when he opens up this epistle, though, he opens up with more of a declaration of an eyewitness account in the face of false teaching. And he does this. He says, what was from the beginning what we've heard and what we've seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands concerning this word of life. And life was manifested. Then he says, what we've seen, we testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And then he said, what we've seen and we heard, we proclaim to you also that indeed, that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Then in verse five, it kind of shifts and it builds the bridge to the next section when he says, this is a message which we received and we announce to you that God is what? God is what? Light. And in him there is no, not only no darkness, but no darkness at all. And so what he's going to counter is something that is quite striking to our 21st century of version of Christianity. A lot of times we see Christianity is leaning toward more of a a conducive to what we would say user-friendly or non-offensive or we don't want to put people in an awkward mode. And and yet you see in Scripture, especially in 1 John, we come into the very, like the sixth verse of the entire 105 verses and he's going to address a problem called false teachers. And I think sometimes we forget that our version of Christianity isn't just simply to make you feel good or to be entertained. It's not for you just to come in and say, oh, pastor, that gave me um, goosebumps. Or, oh, you know, I felt like, oh, that was a great, great show. Um, Or, oh, I felt entertained. Um, I want you to understand first century Christianity was about the truth, about speaking it with clarity as well as with love. And so what we're gonna see in verses six, verse eight, in verse 10, is he's going to actually give us the content of the claims of those who were false teachers. In fact, in your outline, I even put it in these phrase, in this term, those who walk in darkness claim. So we can also put false teachers claim. And there's going to be three of them. In verse 6, it says, uh, uh, if we claim that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness... Then verse 8 says, if we claim that we have no sin. In verse 10, it says, if we claim that we have not sinned. So these are all what we would say, if you walk in darkness, this is what you actually make a statement, a declaration. Now, John's going to help us out on this because it's kind of a a, a very well-structured and paralleled passage in in these um, cycles, three cycles of false claims. The first will say simply, this is the announcement of the claim. The second one will be an assessment of it. Like, what does John and what does really God say about this claim that they make? But then I love how John comes back and he actually affirms to those who are walking in the light, what does it look like based in contrast to these claims? Now, I know I always come with a very clear understanding that you're here, whether you're visiting for the very first time, or whether you've been coming for a long time, if you're a member, or if you're um, not a member, you're just a 20-year attender, you're still here by divine appointment. That there's no accident that you're about to hear what you're about to hear. That God has a specific word that has been crafted by the one who created you and the one who knows you better than anyone else. And so what I'm gonna challenge you today is to examine your hearts. We're coming to the table at the end of the service. 
So I want you to examine your heart, but not based on your own filters or based on your own knowledge or your experience or what you feel, but based on what the Word of God says. So this is going to push you a little bit out of your comfort zone because God's Word always kind of speaks a little different than we speak, and He sees things radically different than a lot of times we see. So let's see what the first claim. So those who walk in darkness make this first claim in verse 6. It says, if we say that, we have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness. So that's the claim. Remember last week, if you were here, the word fellowship is our word koinonia, which means partnership. It means a, a connection. It means an um, intimate communion. It means that you, you are tied in. That means you're in cadence with God, that you're in step with him, that everything that you do is in line with him in obedience to his word and that would meet his heart and his passion and his direction and his plan. So it's a partnership, it's a coming together, it's a commonality, it's a bond, it's a covenant, it's a binding agreement of affection and loyalty. So all of those are in that word. So these are the people that says we're really close with God. Now if I were to ask each of you today, especially on Sunday morning at 11.15, how many of you would say this is the holiest of all of our services? Nobody here would say that? So if you're the most ungodly, you would come to the 11.15, is that what you're saying? So here we have probably the holiest service, right? Y'all have had more time to pray to get ready for this service, amen? And so as you prepare your heart. So if I were to ask you, what is your relationship with God like? How would you describe it? Say, how is your relationship with God? How many of you would say, boo how? No, we would say, it's fine, pastor. And it's so quick to assess our relationship with God based on whether or not we're in attendance at 1115. Whether or not we're in church or do we know the songs? Did we say the Lord's Prayer in just a moment ago? Did, did, did we raise our hand that says you're never going to give on us? And we base our, maybe our fellowship, our connection, our partnership with God based on this assessment that we are in a religious activity and we've done religious functions or we have a certain amount of knowledge. So it says we have this tightness, a connection with God, but yet it says we walk in darkness. So there's a disparity, a, a gap between what we say and who we are. But it's quite shocking how many people are saying they're real close to God. Let me ask you this. If you say you're real close to God, does that mean you're in obedience to God's command? Does it mean that you're, you're walking in step with him, that you have a passion for the things of God? Now, it doesn't mean that you're sinless, but whenever you sin, you immediately see it, and you correct it and realign yourself. But it's so easy for us to say God and I are tight or God and I are okay but our lives look radically different. As we heard last week, you're either completely in the light or you're completely in the darkness. There's no in between. And the moment we allow sin to come into our heart and stay there, darkness creeps in. And so God says this false teaching of those who walk in the darkness actually make the claim that they and God are okay, that we're all right, that everything is fine, but yet we're still walking in darkness and we're still holding on to sin. Maybe a an extreme picture of this is in my former church, I a, a dear sister and her husband were separated and they were having all kinds of marital problems and we had worked with the family with the three kids and everything and our hearts were just grieving with the separation and so uh, we were praying over them and God really one day prompted me to go visit the husband that, and he was in another house and where the wife was living at the time. And so I knocked on the door and the, the person who opened the door wasn't the man, it was actually another lady that was in a nightgown. Not appropriate dress at all, but she, I said, hey, I'm Pastor Rodney, and I'm here to see, and I mentioned his name. Oh, Pastor, I'm so glad you're here. Come on in. I'm sure he'll be glad to see you. And this is the girl that he was living with while he was still married. And so I'm coming in, and she says, oh, let me go change. And I said, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This is really good, because it was very inappropriate what she was wearing. And so I'll go back to talk to my brother and said, hey, how's it going? Oh, Pastor, I'm fine. Now remember, he's married to somebody else and there's a woman living in his house in a nightgown that shouldn't be, in, I mean, she shouldn't have answered the door and yet there she is and he's saying he's fine. I went, what do you mean? Could you elaborate? Oh, work is going great, da, da, da. My relationship with the kids are tight, everything's good. I said, okay, how's your relationship with the Lord? Oh, pastor, it's never been better. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm reading the Bible. I'm having my quiet time, I'm praying. My quiet time, I said, in my mind I'm going, your quiet time is very quiet. Because it's only you showing up, God is nowhere near here. 
And yet in his mind, he thought because he was reading scripture and because he was praying that he and God were okay. And yet he was living in absolute sin. So I'm wondering today as you come in, if we were to ask you how you're doing with your relationship with God, would you say, God and I are tight, Pastor. We're close. I'm in prayer. I'm in ministry. I'm in service. I'm reading scripture. And yet your heart is holding on to sin. And so what does God call this? And he's going to make an assessment. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with God and yet walk in darkness, look what it says. It says that we lie and do not practice the truth. So that word lie means that we say one thing that in actuality, it's not true. That's inaccurate. Now, it's amazing to me, especially in the 21st century, how we can change the word sin to fit and to adopt, adapt to something to cover what we do. Let me give you an example. Used to be when a, 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 guy, a, a person sh, uh, shoplifted, he was called a what? If somebody did shoplifting, what was his category that he would be in? What sin? Thief, right? But now they're no longer called thieves, all right, or thieves. They're actually called a cost of living adjustment specialist. <laughs> so it's a little different, right? It sounds better. It sounds like, ooh, that sounds like a promising career. Some of our young adults are getting excited up there. Cost of living adjustment specialist? <laughs> no, you're a thief. That's what you are. Well, some people say, Okay, lazy, you know, lazy, that's what it is. This is pure lazy. And yet we've changed the word lazy to be we're motivationally dispossessed. <laughs> so we make adjustments, right? And tragically, we even see this in this side of the world that the prostitutes are now called sex care providers. We've changed it, haven't we? In order to make our lifestyle okay, we don't want to call it sin, surely, right? And so what do we call it? God's word says we're lying. But you're saying, hey, pastor, you know, the world's looking at it a little bit differently. It doesn't really matter today what the world says. It's what does God say? And God says, when you call sin something other than what it is not, you lie. If you say that you're walking with God and you're not, you're lying. It says not only do you lie, there's a second assessment. It says you do not practice the truth. The highlight is on the, or the emphasis is on the action doesn't mean that you don't know the truth. They know the truth, but they don't practice. They don't do the truth. Many of you are well-versed in what God requires and what he does not, what pleases God, what doesn't, but that doesn't, that's not really the issue today. The issue is, do you practice the truth? If you say you're okay with God, but you're not practicing the truth, if you're, not, if you're forsaking the assembling together as it is the habit of some, you're not practicing the truth. If you're not yielding as a child, honoring your parents and obeying your parents, you're not practicing the truth. You know the truth, but you don't practice. Now, I'm going to ask you a personal question. We're going to probe a little bit. How many of you have ever been on a diet? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have ever broken that diet? Just raise your hand. It's the same hands. It's amazing how that works. <laughs> but you know the diet. The diet says this is what you do, and yet we know it, and yet we still break it. We know what God says, but God says, when we break that, we do not practice the truth. Well, I love John. He comes back around in verse 7 with what I would call an affirmation to those who walk in the light. Now, remember, if you walk in the darkness, this is what you say. God and I are okay, but you, yet you still live in sin. God's assessment of me and you, if we do that, is that we lie and we do not practice the truth. So the second, or the affirmation is this. If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, and that means that we walk where God is, and we already established that last week when we're walking in the light, we, God and you are really tight. That's actually the reality. We're a 10 in the light of, of the light of God. That means we're in cadence with him. It means that God can be seen, God can be found, and God can be heard. Does it mean that we're sinless? No, no, not at all. But when we do sin, we immediately see that it's sin, and we make that correction, that realignment, we repent and we put ourselves back and God aligns us back in line with him. And so that's what it means. So the assumption is, is that we already are in fellowship with God if we walk in the light. But then there are two additional benefits. It says in verse seven, if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with whom? What does your scripture say in verse seven? We have fellowship with whom? 
one another. The second benefit is that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So when you walk in the light, God says, not only do you have fellowship, partnership, connection, intimacy, and communion with God himself, that doesn't stop there. It actually goes and transcends to everyone around you. That Now, there are no lines and there are no barriers. There's no uh, lines of demarcation. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter how many letters are at the beginning of your name or how many letters are at the end of your name that there's no status symbol that separates us. When we come into this body of Christ, everyone comes here and here forgiven by the same blood of Jesus Christ. There are no, there's no hierarchy, there's no status, there's no one better, no one worse. God says that we have fellowship, that we have partnership, that we're connected with one another. I think sometimes we forget the power of that. I know in our former church we had 44 different Um, nations represented in a church that was in what we call the deep south where there was a big divide between the black and the white and there was a film crew that heard about our church and they wanted to do a a Baptist group that wanted to do a a, a spot on us and so they were interviewing our people they were filming us and everything and so the crew came down it was four white men Caucasian men in their 40s and 50s and so they were you know they were setting up shop and they were doing the camera angles and they were in our worship service But in the middle of the worship service, I was sitting about right where Adrian and PC are, and I I was standing there, we were just worshiping, and the director, the producer of the the crew came, and he tapped my shoulder, and tears were streaming down his face. I said, man, is he okay? Like, is he going to be able to finish? Can he see the camera at all? I mean, he looked really messed up. And I said, hey, brother, you okay? He says, yes, yes, I just need to talk to you. So it's in the middle of the singing. I mean, songs were going on, and he's just having this real intense conversation with me. He says, Pastor, when I came, when you told us, we, we knew you were a multi-ethnic church, a multiracial church, I just thought, since you had 44 different nations, I just thought every nation or every group would sit in their own section. Like the Africans would sit here, the Latinos would sit here, the whites would sit here, the blacks, you know, they would sit, in, but they look like they're sitting on, like together. And then he says, then they look like they, they know each other. Like they have some type of contact. And then when you did the greeting, and then he really begins to cry. And he says, I, 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 they look like they actually love each other. And I'm wondering how many times people come into IBC and they see that if we have this, this, this walking in the light, that there are no lines between color of skin, status, educational level, place of origin, doesn't matter. God says that we have fellowship with one another. The second benefit says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So that sin mars us, it, it stains us, it, it, it pollutes us, and so it needs to be cleansed, it needs to be washed, it needs to be purified. And so whether, as one writer says, whether it's a disease of the soul, whether it's an opium of the will, or whether it's a madness of the brain, that this blood comes and he cleanses all of that. Has it ever, con- I mean, some of you are in the medical field, but how many of you have ever been confused with blood and cleaning? Like, usually when somebody gets a cut or somebody's bleeding, what do we usually rush to do? Clean up the wound, right? Thursday, I was playing basketball with our men. I'm not going to say which member did it, but a member came and just hit me so hard and busted my lip, and blood was coming everywhere, okay? And, the, and they would say, Pastor, you need to clean your lip. The blood's everywhere. So we associate blood with being dirty and we need to clean it right we need to wash it we need to get it clean but why would the scripture say the blood of jesus christ cleanses us in christianity today several years ago there was a doctor by the name of dr brand that actually says what is the connection between blood and cleansing and so he said let me give you an experiment now i'm going to ask each of you not to do this experiment all right because it's a doctor in a magazine that i'm relaying to you so don't go home and do this but he puts he says put a cuff on your the blood pressure cuff on your arm pump up the pressure to 200 cc's and he says let it sit there for a while and then he says squeeze your fist 10 times and what happens then he says when you do that if you just let it sit suddenly there will be a flash of pain that will go into your arm And then he says, if you keep on doing any type of activity, that flash of pain pain then turns into intense agony. But if you were to release that cuff, he says, physiologically, you will have experienced the cleansing of the blood. And so he explains it. 
He says when you exert energy or, or effort, and that effort, you put that in in order to produce that energy, there's a byproduct called metabolites that are toxins that they get accumulated in your cells, but yet when the blood flows, it washes it, but if it, when you're doing that cuff and that squeezing, that activity's going on, the toxins are not released, which in, then creates pain. But the moment you let that cuff go, the toxins are pure and they get washed and they get cleansed away. So in the spiritual application, it looks like this. We come into worship service and we do our spiritual exercises. We sing, we raise our voices, we read scripture, we serve, we go on mission trips. But if the blood of Jesus Christ does not cleanse us from our sin, that's why many of your faces look like they do, right? Because you're in pain. <laughs> you have not experienced the joy of the forgiveness of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so it's a pain to come to church. It's a pain and agony to share your faith. It's a, and some of you are in really physical pain when you're trying to give money to the church as well. But if the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you, these religious activities and these exercises, actually the pain is removed from your, pain, uh, from your praise and your agony is removed from your, ang uh, your anguish is removed from your activity and Jesus gives you the joy. So first claim of those who walk in darkness is this, that we have fellowship with God and yet we walk in darkness. Let me ask you again based on the word of God, is that described you? That you say, no, God and I are okay, pastor. I'm an eight, I'm a seven, I'm a six, I'm a nine. But yet you walk in darkness. God says we lie and do not practice the truth. But God says if you do walk in the light as he himself is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. So if you and your wife and you and your husband are at odds, if you and your parents are at odds, if there's a division between brothers and sisters in Christ and you're not in right relationship with God, I'm telling you, you're walking in darkness. This is what God says, even if you're in the middle of a church service. So God says, if you do that, you have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Second claim, found in verse eight. It says, if we say that, we have no sin. So that claim, you gotta look at the word sin. It's in singular form, which is a little different. It doesn't say if we don't have any sins, but rather we have no sin. So it really points to what I would say is our sinful nature. This is the part that says, this is kind of the core of who we are. So we make the claim, we say, where would they even get this, these false teachers? Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and old things have what? Passed away. So they would make the claim that their nature, sinful nature, has been eradicated, has been removed, and so now they're just clean that they're not incapable of, of that. So they have a new nature. So regardless of what their activities may be, their nature is now without sin. Well, look at the assessment of that. The assessment says, if you say that we have no sin, it says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And the word deceive comes from the word in the first century that describes planets that are orbiting, kind of wandering out there. And so what John is saying is when you say that your sinful nature has been eradicated, that you have no sin, you're making that assessment, God says in his word, assesses us, that says we're wondering, we're led astray from the truth. And then he further assesses us and says the truth is no longer in us. What is truth? The word. If you say that you have no sin and the word says you have sin, then you do not have the word of God inside of you. If you say that you have no sin and the word and truth is Jesus Christ, it says Jesus Christ is not inside of you, the truth. And that is Jesus who he is. John 14, 6 says, I'm the way, the truth. So if you make that claim that your sinful nature has been eradicated and removed, God says you deceive, you wonder, you, you're led astray from, from the truth and, and you're led into false teaching and you do not have the truth inside of you. There's a book by the name, or author by the name of William Goetz that it's in a book called Apocalypse Now, and he describes a man who had a very bad habit of smoking lots of cigarettes. And so his friend was very concerned about him. So his friend was able to give him some medical journals for him to read about the dangers of smoking. So it took a little bit of time, but he, he worked himself through all those journals. And he began to see the connection between, and the dangers of smoking, and maybe the possible connection between smoking and lung cancer. 
And so he brought all the journals back to his friend and he handed, he says, hey, thank you for giving me these, these journals. I've read it and I've seen there's pro a probable connection between smoking, especially excessive smoking, and lung cancer. So I've decided to quit reading. I'm wondering how many times we come into church and we hear somebody that says something that confronts you with the sin. And so you decided to quit, not sinning, but coming. Why would I keep coming to church? I feel so accused, Pastor. They're always condemning. They always point out my sin. They always make me feel uncomfortable. So instead of confessing your sin, you actually quit coming to church. You quit reading the Bible because it, it, it kind of paints a picture of who Christ is and who we need to be and who we're not. And so we just, instead of quit sinning, we quit reading. We quit coming. We quit hearing. It's an ironic paradox, isn't it, that if we admit that we're sinners, we actually are living in the truth. Isn't that kind of shocking, isn't it? You think, oh, I'm only in the truth if I'm sinless. No, God's word says if we admit that we're sinners, then we live in the truth. The moment we deny ourselves as sinners and we say, no, we're not sinners or we're not that bad of a person, and all of a sudden we say that, God says you actually are lying and you're not living in the truth. In fact, one writer says that you're doubly damned. You're damned first, condemned first, because you're a sinner. Second, you're oblivious to that sin, which makes it worse. Not only do you have the sin, you refuse to see that you have the sin. I think sometimes um, Spurgeon said this. It says, you know, to, 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 for a man to walk into the ocean and say, you know, there's no water is actually... Uh, not as foolish as a person who looks at his own body and, say, and says, there is no sin. And if you can walk in any ocean around us and you know water's everywhere, we lo look at our body and there's sin everywhere. But God has given us a choice right now. Are we gonna walk in the truth or are we gonna walk in falsehood? So what's the affirmation? I think many of us are very comforted by the affirmation found in verse nine. Let's quote it together. I think many of you know this verse. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to what? Forgive us of our sins and what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What an amazing assessment, right? I, I, I think over this past week, I've been kind of taken back a little bit because I think for those who've grown up in Christianity, we just assume that God should forgive us. We just assume that's just the way it should be, that he should just automatically forgive us. Tragically, over the last couple of months, I've realized that I have a lot of people in my life that I've asked for forgiveness, and they've refused to forgive me. They just won't forgive me. They say, Pastor Rod, I can't forgive you, or Rod, I can't forgive you, whatever it is. They just won't forgive me, and they hold it against me. And, and in a weird way, I may even deserve that. If I've hurt somebody, if I've offended somebody, then, then that on the human scale, on the human realm, you would say, I want them to forgive me, but I've done damage to them. So you can see the pain, you can see the hurt, and there's just people out there that won't forgive me. I, I'm wondering how much more God, he's holy, he's without sin. Uh, uh, why should we be so presumptuous that he should just forgive us automatically. I think for us who've grown up in Christianity, we've been drilled in. Confess your sins, he'll forgive. God loves you, God wants to forgive you. And trust me, that truth is still the same. But I just want to know, when's the last time you've caught yourself in a sense of awe that God even wants to offer that to you and to me? I, I, I don't know that I could be in position to presume that God should forgive me. And I know the people that I've hurt, I can never go to them and presume that they should forgive me because I've hurt them so deeply. How much more should I ever presume that God should forgive me because I've defied him and I've, 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 I've disobeyed him and I've dishonored him? So before we get into this, I think we just forget that God wants to forgive us, but he doesn't have to. This is who he is. This is his character. Many of you recognize the name Woody Allen. He's a movie producer and actor and everything, but he's also an atheist. But he said, if there is a God, which obviously he doubts, but he says, if there is a God, I would like to hear three words from him. 
This comes from an atheist, right? He's just making a hypothetical statement. If there is a God, I'd like to hear three words. Guess what those three words are? You are forgiven. Even a person who doesn't believe in God craves forgiveness. I'm encouraging you today, if you're going to walk in the light, God's got some good news for you today. Believers, be affirmed that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's work through that phrase just a little bit. If we confess our sins, the word literally means to say the same thing. So say the same thing as who? As your wife? As your husband or your parents? No, 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 no. Say the same thing as God. God is light, remember? And in him there's no darkness. So whatever we do cannot be hidden from his eyes. So everything, your motive, your heart, your soul, your actions, what nobody else sees, he sees it all. And so when you confess your sin, it's not like you are giving God fresh insight. That you're not giving him new information that you've sinned. Oh, and God said, you know what? I didn't know that. I'm so glad you told me. That's not our God. He already knows that we've sinned and he's already has spoken through conviction. But when we confess after the conviction, we agree, we say, we speak the same thing that the conviction of what God has already said to us. So we're in agreement. But it's not like just simply saying, okay, God, I agree with you. I'm a sinner. Okay, I got that. No, no, no. It's a conviction that pulls us to repentance. That there's a yearning to not do what you've done. That to, 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 to make it right, to change, to, to, to shift, to, to go in a new direction with a new mind. So that's what it means if we confess. Now, it says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let me start with the, 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 what I would call God's activity first. He does two things for us if we come clean. If we speak and we acknowledge what we've done is wrong and we agree with his voice and we come with a heart of repentance and a heart ready to change, God says his activity says he will, number one, he will forgive Many of you are lawyers here, and actually that word forgive is a legal term. It means that you're not declared innocent, but you've been acquitted. That you're relieved of guilt, of liability. That all those things that now you've been, the ledger has been cleared now. Someone else has taken on that liability, that, that spiritual debt on your behalf. It doesn't declare you're innocent. It just means that you're acquitted. The second word is the same word we talked about earlier, forgive and cleanse. We get our word catheter, and many of you are in the medical field, so you know the catheter cleanses the system and purges all of its impurities. And God's activity, when you confess, when you agree, when you say the same thing as the Spirit of God convicting you, he will forgive. He will let that debt go. He will write you off the ledger. You'll be acquitted and you'll be cleansed, purged, purified, clean, forgiven. Then, why does he do it? Because of his character. There's two phrases that speak of his character, and God always acts out of who he is. So what he does comes from who he is. So who is he? He, is just, he says he is um, f- faithful. That word faithful means that he's reliable and trustworthy. That means if he's made a promise to you that he will forgive you, and when you confess your sins, he is trustworthy. He is absolutely reliable that he will forgive. Does he, do you deserve it? Do I deserve it? Absolutely no. But he promised it and he's not going to relent or change his promises. He will be faithful to that. Then the second part of his character is he is just. This is a part I think 21st century Christians have the most trouble with. Because we just think God should just love us and that should be enough. It gives us the freedom to do anything we want. God will forgive us. No worry, pastor. He loves me. And when we look at other people trying to confront our sin, we're going, no, no, God just loves me. But we forget that he is just. What does just mean? It means that he has to deal with sin. He has to. You say, but that's so mean. I I just like my sin. I I like dating my unbelieving. I I like being in that lifestyle. I like using the words that I use. I like my critical tongue. I don't want to change my my condemning spirit. I I don't want to change my my hunger for money or my desire, my aspirations for for status. I don't want to change all of that. Well, Well, God's word says that that sin, no matter what we carry, has to be dealt with. But he not only is just, but he also provides what I call the justifier. So 2 Corinthians 5 tells us this, and this is a powerful picture of how much he loves us. He says, he who, made, who had no sin became sin on my behalf 
that we, that I might become the righteousness of God in him. So God allowed his son, the righteousness, to cover my unrighteousness. So let me tell you how serious sin is. It cost him his son. So that's an affirmation to us as believers in verse 9. Then we come to the third and the final false claim. And that's found in verse 10. It says, if we say that, we've already heard, if we say that we have fellowship with God and we're tight with God, but yet we still walk in darkness, we still don't obey God, we still do whatever we want to do, we, we understand what that claim is. Second claim is we have no more sinful nature. Old things have passed away, so we really don't have that sinful nature anymore. We don't have to deal with that. But this one is actually the most blatant of all of them. It says, if we say that we have not sinned at all, like where would they get that? Well, remember last week, it was a little technical last week with Gnosticism, where they separated the body from the spirit. And perhaps this group of believers would say, hey, my spirit is clean. Now, whatever my body does, even if I commit immorality or if I lust or if I worry, if I'm greedy, that's in the flesh. So really, that doesn't even count. And you say, honestly, Pastor, no one really ever says that here nowadays, right? Let me give you the 21st century version of this false claim. How many of you know people who will never say, I've done wrong? Don't point at them right now, okay? But you know people, right, who never admit they're wrong. Never. They never say, I've sinned. Is that not the same? It says, we have not sinned. They're, they're just saying, I'm, I'm not wrong. Now, it may, it may in, a, in a particular case, but the person had the audacity to say, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't sinned. It's the same claim. So what's the assessment here? It gets a little bit severe, doesn't it? Or, or more severe. In verse 6, the assessment was, you lie and do not practice the truth. That's pretty bad. Verse 8, the assessment is, well, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. But look at the assessment here. This is why I think the, the, the claim is actually more blatant and more um, culpable to God's judgment. It says, you make him a liar. Who? Who do you make a liar when you say, I haven't sinned. I haven't done anything wrong. Pastor, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> what does the word say? You make who a liar? God. Now, I know you know that do not lie or do not bear false witness is actually in the Ten Commandments. Do you know which one? Which commandment? Some of you are on one, two, three, four. It's number nine. Do not bear false witness. So we know it's a sin. You break the commandments if you lie. Ananias and Sapphira paid with their life, did they not? For lying and deceiving. So we understand the, 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 the danger of that. But what's tragic is if it's a ninth commandment and Ananias and Sapphira lied and it cost him their life how much more if we actually call god a liar how do you call god a liar you just said you don't sin and god says in his word that we sin so now the judgment comes that assessment is really 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 getting more and more severe so not only do you call him a liar but then it says the word is not in you what word two i think jesus christ it's the word, but also the word of God is not in you. The word says it is able to save your soul in James chapter one, his word that's planted inside of you. So his word now is not in you. Jesus is not inside of you, and you've called God a liar. Well, now we shift to what we call the affirmation to those who walk in the light, and we close the chapter two, verses one and two. So John says, my beloved children, I love that, right? He's 90 years old. He can say that. My beloved children. He says, I write these things to you in order that you may not what? Sin. I, I, I want you to know God's goal for you is for you not to sin. His goal for you is to walk in purity and holiness. Be holy as I am holy. That's his goal. So there's no doubt about that. Don't, don't get confused. And that word that we're talking about in verse 10 actually keeps us. One of the very first memory verses that some of you memorized in the Old Testament was this. Your word I have hid in my heart that I may not what? Sin against God. So obviously to keep the word inside of you will prevent you from sinning. But if the word is not inside of you, you will sin according to God's word. Even in the wilderness, Jesus, when he was dealing with Satan, right? He says, as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When Satan tempted to jump 
down from the temple height. He says, according to the word of God, as it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to a foolish test. When he says, if you bow down to me and I'll give you all the domains of this world, he says, you shall, according to the word of God, as it is written, you shall serve me and me alone. So he's, again, how the word is so important, right? But yet, God's word says, if he's written this to us in order that we may not sin. But look at the next phrase, quickly. It doesn't even change verse numbers. It's the same verse. But if anyone does sin, don't you love John? <laughs> he kind of gives you that goal, like that aspiration, don't sin. But he says, oh, yeah, by the way, when you do sin, I've got some help for you. But I think for us, I think we as Christians, we forget how serious sin is, how destructive it is, how it divides families, how it breaks hearts, how it destroys the next generation, how it rips through churches, how it devastates the, 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 the spiritual vitality of a church because of sin. I think we use phrases. I'm going to use a couple of phrases. I'm going, to, I'm going to challenge you with these phrases. These are words that I think the 21st century Christians have come up with to kind of like tolerate sin. How many of you have ever heard this? God loves the sinner but hates the sin. Have you heard that? Now, that, that usually, it's true. Don't, 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 I'm not saying that that part is true, but the implication is quite interesting. God hates the sin, basically hates what you do, but he still loves you, and which is true, but sometimes this you inside is still sinful. There's still things inside of you. Like, for instance, if you commit adultery, there's still a lustful heart. Oh, God hates adultery, but you, know, you still got that part inside of you that's deeply embedded. And sometimes I think we just try to distance ourselves and just kind of, we, we, we don't really deal with the seriousness and the depth of how sin has permeated into our very core of who we are. Yes, God loves you, no doubt about that. But sometimes I think sin is so deeply inside of us we don't even know. Just as long as we say, Lord, forgive me for this and this and this, and we think we're okay. Another statement, well, that's the way God made me. Oh, I can't tell you how many times we've, we've seen that. God has never created you to sin. Oh, no, that's the way I'm right, Pastor. No, he has created you in the image of God, and God is holy. So if we ever use that excuse, well, God made me this way, that's actually a contradiction to what God's word says when you use that as an excuse for a lifestyle or a sinful behavior. Another one that Christians often use is this. I love this one. I'm not perfect, Pastor. I'm just forgiven. Like, what does that mean? Really, think about it. I'm not perfect. I'm just forgiven. You know what that does? It only settles the account when you go to heaven. But it almost gives you an excuse to let that sin kind of dwell right now and not for you to do anything about it. Oh, I'm, I'm not perfect, which gives you a permission to keep on sinning? I think we don't think, we don't take sin that seriously. The last one, this is my favorite one, because I get told this all the time here at IBC, Pastor, don't judge lest you be judged. So tell me the implication. That's scripture, right? No doubt. But what do you think the implication is? It's not that hard to figure out, right? Pastor, don't judge lest you be judged, which means you leave my sin alone and take care of your own sin, which is absolutely true. But it doesn't say do not judge, period. It says do not judge lest you be judged. In the way that you judge others, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. But it doesn't say do not judge. It just says make sure that whenever you do confront somebody, that you are clean and pure and holy before you bring it to them. But what people push back, they're asking you and they're uninviting you. They're defriending you. They don't want you in their space because they want the freedom to sin. So they tell you, don't judge me, lest you be judged, which gives them the freedom to keep on doing what they're doing. Our job as a body of Christ is to deal seriously with sin. How sin, how much, how serious is sin in the New Testament? In John alone, the word sin, the actual word sin, appears 17 times. In the New Testament, it appears 153 times. In the Old Testament, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, 545 times. Tell me, does God take sin seriously? That was not a it's not a simple, I mean, it's not a hard question. Does God take sin seriously? It cost him his son. 
Why aren't we taking sin seriously? So the false claim is made, right? And then he comes back, my little children, I write these things in order that you, what? Not sin. But if you do sin, which all of us will, we have three things that are going for us. It says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So number one, what's the word advocate? It's the same word that's used in John 16 that describes the Holy Spirit. We call it the paraclete, the one that comes alongside. So we as sinners, we have a, somebody who will actually walk with us out of the sin into holiness, out of this uh, condemnation into forgiveness. We have an advocate. We have somebody that will fight our, our, while the accusations are made, they will be a mediator, an intercessor, they will be a helper. We're not left unattended. We're not left abandoned, even in our sin, which all of us will sin, but God will give us help. The second one is not only do we have an advocate, but this Jesus Christ is righteous as well. It's the same word that she used earlier about God is just. And what that means is that now Jesus is, is a, it's pretty amazing. He's righteous and the judge is righteous, which means they will never be in conflict with one another. How many of you have ever seen a lawyer and a judge in complete agreement about everything? It never happens, does it? But this lawyer is in complete agreement with this judge because this judge is righteous and this lawyer is righteous. So they're going to be completely in, in connection with each other. And he's righteous, so how does God, the judge, righteous, deal with unrighteousness? This is what he does. He allows his son to put his righteousness on behalf of our unrighteousness, and he bridges the gap. Then the last one is he is the tone and sacrifice. In verse 2, it's a big word. We don't use it very often. It's only used a couple times in the New Testament. He says he's a propitiation for our sins, not only for us, but also for the entire world. That word propitiation comes from a temple sacrifice, that something had to be offered on behalf of something else, that the shedding of blood had to take place in order for for forgiveness to come. And so God's wrath, and sometimes we don't like to use the word God's wrath in the 21st century, easy Christianity, but God's wrath has to be dealt with when we sin. And so the only way that wrath is dealt with, and that wrath, I've always defined it as God's settled, um, um, holy antagonism towards sin, that he cannot sit by and just watch you sin. That's who God is. He's holy. But yet his holiness allows God's propitiation, which is Jesus Christ, to appease and to satisfy the wrath of God in order for us to experience his forgiveness. And so as we come to this table this morning, I'm going to ask you to do what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins that we openly acknowledge what we've done is wrong. If we say that we have not sinned or we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, we lie and we do not practice the truth. God's word is so clear on that. We even God call God a liar that says if we have no sin, if we have not sinned. So God's given us a chance at this table to openly admit that we're wrong, that we've sinned, that we've fallen short. So part of the first step is acknowledge, admit. The second, the second part of this plan is for us to repent, for us to say, I'm going to turn this around. If I've been abandoned in church, I'm going to come back. If I've been a miser with my money, I'm going to start giving. If I've been critical with my mouth, I'm going to be encouraging with my mouth. If I've been a worrier, I'm going to start trusting God. If I've been jealous, I'm going to let that go and be generous in my spirit I'm going to always put somebody's needs ahead of my own. If I'm greedy for the things of this world, I'm going to start hungering for the things of God. If, if I'm not honoring my parents, if I'm disobeying, I'm going to yield to them. Even if, when we disagree and they don't make sense, God's word says I honor my parents, I obey my parents. If you're single, God is calling you to be pure. God is calling you to save yourself for relationship. God has called you to, to serve God. God has called you to, to, to be in right relationship with your coworkers and with your extended family. But if you're single, you, you've been set aside by God for this season and, for, and maybe for a long time, but you said, I'm gonna serve God in my fullest capacity. And yet sometimes we use our singleness to do whatever we wanna do because there's nobody to answer to and you've lost your accountability. And so God is calling you as a single to be a part of a small group or be a part of a group that will pray over you, that you will be answerable to. And if you're in a relationship of a husband and wife, God has called you specifically and you haven't been yielding to your husband, you haven't been loving your wife, God says this is a time to change. 
So no matter what the sin is, whether you've desired spirit, a, a status among, with the world, whether you, you, you have pride in, of your achievement and your accomplishment, God says now it's time to humble yourself, admit, acknowledge, then repent. And then when this table is open to everybody, this is not IBC's table, this is the Lord's table. If you're here and you are a believer and you've opened your heart up to Christ and you've confessed him as your Lord, we invite you to take this table. But today is gonna be a little different. Only if your posture, your spiritual posture, is in with an attitude of receiving God's forgiveness. And you cannot receive God's forgiveness until you confess. So really, this table actually becomes a spiritual transaction table. You do an exchange. You offer your sin, he will give you his forgiveness. But if you do not want to do that, if you want to hold on to your sin, if you want to hold on to your defiance, if you want to hold on to your worry, your lust, if you want to hold on to your greed, your jealousy, your pride, if you want to hold on to your anger, your bitterness, your resentment, your unforgiven spirit, I'm going to challenge you from the word of God to let this tray pass. Don't take it. He says, examine your heart. Take it with reverence. But if you do choose to take it, let it represent you're receiving God's forgiveness today. That you're openly admitting that you've sinned, you're openly acknowledging that you are turning away from that sin, and now you're receiving God's forgiveness. And as you take the cup, let the action of actually pulling the cup out of the tray be a sign that you are in spiritual posture to receive his forgiveness. Let's prepare our hearts. I'm gonna ask that our men come forward now. Fathers, we come to this holy gathering around this table that represents a sacredness and a purity that you desire. Father, you said in your word, if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray that over the next few moments, each of us here would examine our hearts to see what sins we have. We want to walk in the light we want to openly acknowledge what we've done is wrong, but we want to turn away from those as well. Father, get us in position to be in a spiritual posture to receive your forgiveness now. Prepare our hearts in Jesus' name. As you take this cup, I'm going to ask that you hold on to it until we can take it together as a body of Christ. As we encourage each of you to remember if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My prayer is that you've not only admitted and acknowledged sins that maybe no one else can see, but not only acknowledge an agreement with the voice of the spirit of conviction, but also a heart to repent, a heart to change, a heart to turn. And God's word says, then I will forgive. That you're in posture, that you're in position to receive. And as you take this cup and bread this morning, I've encouraged you to be in a spiritual posture to receive God's forgiveness after we've confessed and repented. On the last night, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to each of his disciples. And he said, take and eat for this is my body, which is given for you. The writer of Hebrews says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness and remission of sins. And so as Jesus passed his cup around, and he and probably only he knew what was just ahead for him. He did not have to come. He laid down his life on his own initiative. He does not have to forgive us, but he did. So he said, take, drink. For this is the blood of the covenant for the forgiveness of your sins. So we transition from this side of the, this is part of the service. I'm going to ask my brother Nathan to come and close us with a word of prayer. And if you are here today and you're on this journey, and you just would love someone just to chat with you or talk with you. Peter's always here at the front, and I am as well. All the men that have passed out the cup, 
are all available. Our pastors, our deacons, our elders are all available. Our leaders and their wives are available as well. But we're just going to encourage you to walk in the light, to walk in truth. I'm going to ask Nathan to come and lead us in a time of prayer now.